written down here is the book of Revelation is sequential in nature. You know, it's just not a haphazard book, but there's a sequence to it. The first chapter, uh, one, not, uh, 1 verse 19, write these things you have seen, past things. And the second chapter, 2 and 3, technically, the present things. And then the third chapter, chapters, 4 through 22 are the future things. So what we have in the book of Revelation is the past things, the present things, and the future things. And so you can go there and see all of those things all gathered together. Now I'm going to be reading from Revelation 4, uh, verses 1 through 11. If you've got a Bible and you want to go along with me, it will give me an opportunity to get myself prepared here. Revelation 4, beginning with verses 1 through 11. And after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like, like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. In verse 6, Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The fourth, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night. And they say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. May God richly bless that portion of his scripture. And verse 9 says, Wherever Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him, who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. May God richly bless the reading of his word. What a powerful, powerful passage of scripture. And I know that when I wrote this and I went back and reread it, and I thought, you didn't even scratch the surface of this passage. This is a, a tremendous eye that we can look into heaven and see a little bit about what's going on behind what we consider to be a closed door, the clouds and the heavens above, uh, above us and all of those things that, that go before this great heaven that someday, Lord willing, we'll all go to. But you know, you have to understand something. Heaven wasn't designed for people. The earth was designed for people. So at some point in time, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And the new earth will be where we will be. And we're going to be, I think, maybe I'll be living on Windsor Cross, Crossing Lane still. I don't know where I'll be living. But I do know this. I'll be here. But when I die, I also understand this. To be absent from the body is to be present with him. Amen. And we can, we can rest assured that that's a reality. And so we praise God. I wrote this. God's will is done in and through his holiness and a wisdom that is greater 
compared to all the books ever written or will ever be written. And you know, that, that caused me some pause to think about all the books that I've got in my library, you know, and, and his will. And you know, the thing of it is about it, we always like to think about our will and how free it is and, and how we can do whatever we want to do. One time some guy was bragging that to me and I said, well listen, if that's true, why aren't you a brain surgeon making hundreds of thousand dollars a year? Or why aren't you able, like if you were on the moon where there's no gra gravitivity, why don't you just jump to the other end of this building? I said, if you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, but you know, all doesn't always mean all in that sense. You have to understand what's being said there. And you have to use the word all in the context of what's being said there. God's will. You know, he has a will. Yes. He has a will. And you know what? His will is not like ours. Our will is corrupted. Our will still has some of the old flesh hanging around in it. Our will still has some sin that seeks to crouch and get you like God said to Cain. Don't you know that sin is crouching at the door just waiting to pounce on you? Well, you know, it's the same thing with us. Sin is just waiting to, to pounce on us. So God has a will. But his will is not corrupted like ours. God will, God's will is done through his holiness. Our will is done through, hopefully, sometimes through the new person that we are in Christ Jesus. But sometimes our will is done through the old Bob. You know, even though the old bot is dead, I'm supposed to be dead to sin but alive to God, but there are times when I don't feel that, I don't think that, and I'm not that. But you know what? That's temporary because I know in reality I am dead to sin but alive to God. We Amen. praise God for that. And God's will operates out of his wisdom and out of his purposes. So often our will is operating even out of our flesh now. You know, we're doing things and we're moving in directions that maybe we shouldn't do, go in. And even that television has a way of trying to move us away from where we're supposed to be. So I wrote, God's will is done and in and through his holiness and wisdom that is greater compared to all the books ever written or ever will be written. And then I wrote this above that. This, I did this this morning. Where it says God's will, I put an arrow up and it said, it is not encumbered as ours is. You know, our wills are encumbered by life. Our wills are encumbered maybe by our health. Our wills are encumbered maybe by the fact that we don't have enough money that we think we should have. So there's a, an encumbrance that takes place in our wills, does it in God's will. He's not encumbered by anything. Not even by his great love. Our wills are not always filtered through a Holy Spirit. You know, before I come up here, I pray, Lord, you, you've got to send your spirit, and I need the unction and the anointing of the Spirit of God to preach. And if I don't have it, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Nor is wisdom often tainting our wills. You know, sometimes we think, you know, there have been times in my life, a long time ago in my Christian life, when I wanted to pop somebody in the mouth. <laughs> You know, there was a time when I grew up where that was the way to settle things. You know, you go out in the alley or go out in the street and duke it out. You can't do that anymore. You know, we're told that he slaps me on one cheek, I turn the other one. Now that is counter to the way I've been raised, <laughs> but that's what the word says, you see? So our wills are tainted sometimes. And sin seems to always want to get a place in our wills. I don't know about you, but temptation sometimes is so strong in my life. And you know, I've said this, and I think I said it last Sunday, that temptation will give you the indication which way your alliance is. Is your alliance on the flesh? Is your alliance on sin? Is your alliance with Satan? 
Or is your alliance with the most holy God through Christ Jesus? Where is your alliance? Temptation will tell you that. How you respond to it. Okay. What we're seeing and hearing in this morning's scripture is so pregnant with so much description that it created glorious pictures of this. Throne room. Can you imagine that throne room? Boy, can't wait to put my peepers on that. <laughs> no, that'd be good. That'd be good. What we're seeing and hearing this morning in scriptures is so pregnant with so much description that it created glorious pictures of this throne room and frankly caused me to ever wonder why I attempted to teach the book of Revelation. That's why I quit. And I'm starting on something else next week for a few more weeks and then I'll come back, I promise you. Number one on your outline sheet, a door wide open in heaven. You know, a wide open door, you can see, you can peer into it. You can look into it. You can see things. You know, when Janet and I go to bed, if we have somebody out there in the other room, we'll close the door. We don't want nobody to look peering in there, you know? And then when, we, when they leave, we open the door up. Because we're not, we're not concerned about that anymore. When we spent time in the ch at the church in Philadelphia, the open door was presented to us Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy. The first thing you need to know about God is he's holy. He's not like us. Now we're moving in that direction. If you're not better today at being holy than you were yesterday, there's something wrong with your life and the way you view all of this. John saw the door... Uh, Oh, wait a minute, let me back up here. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. He opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Right. Yeah. You know, for me, you know, I decided to go in a direction. I thought the door was open, but what I didn't know, the door was shut. So I couldn't go. I could only go so far, but I couldn't go through that door. This is the way life is. He has opened a door and he shuts the door. You know, I, I think about this when they have that lottery thing on TV, you know. And I think this, I, in fact, I said to Janet the other day, I said, God wanted us rich, we'd be rich, you know. But apparently he didn't want us rich. So why would I, if I think that way, why would I go and buy a lottery ticket? That's crazy, because if he wanted to be rich, I didn't need a lottery ticket, he'd have made me rich. But he didn't do that. At any rate, anyway. These things, he who, is, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Listen, I wrote this this morning. Our glorious God is sovereign and always does as he pleases. And if he pleases to open a door for you, he opens a door. If he pleases to keep a door shut for you, he keeps it shut. He's a sovereign God. He rules and reigns even today, and it doesn't seem that way. It seems like everything is going to hell in the handbasket, but the reality is everything is being prepared for our blessed Savior's return. He's our sovereign God. John saw, saw the door. Then he heard a voice. And in the blink of an eye, he was in the spirit, which means his spirit left his body. His body changed by the Holy Spirit into a spiritual rocket ship. I like that sentence that I wrote there. Into a rocket ship. <laughs> because his body not being glorified yet, could not go to heaven. However, his spirit could enter heaven because of the righteousness of Christ and the cleansing of his sins. See? Your body can't get to heaven, but your spirit can. Right. And the reason your spirit can is because of Jesus. Not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Which is, by the way, imputed to his people. 
in order to, uh, if you've been to college and you've taken accounting, you know that imputed is an accounting term. That means what he does is he takes his righteousness and puts it in my account and takes my sin and puts it in his account. That's imputed righteousness. John saw the door that heard a voice. In the blink of an eye, he was in the spirit, which means his spirit left his body. His body changed by the Holy Spirit into a spiritual rocket ship. Because his body had not been glorified yet, he couldn't go to heaven. Now, what did I write above that? Forget that. Anyway, number two on your outline sheet. The key of David, Christ's authority. This is the key of authority, the key of David. And Isaiah 22, 22 says, The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut. You know, I've said this so many times. The book of Revelation is just full of the, of the, uh, of the, the Old Testament. When I first managed a bookstore, I went to the office of the, the owner, who was, by the way, a Jewish man, and uh, I went in and sat down on the other side of his desk, and he looked at me, and he said, he didn't say this, but this is what he, what he meant. His expectations of me were laid out before me. He told me in no other terms, well, one of the things he told me was, I worked down there by Ian McDonald that was just full of good-looking girls. He said, leave them women alone. I said, okay. I did, but boy, it was hard to do in those days, I'm telling you. But anyway, uh, after he gave me his expectations, you know what he did? He pulled open his desk drawer, he opened it up, and he took a key, and he said, here. And he gave me that key. And when he gave me that key, what he was telling me was, Go down and run my store. You have the authority to manage my store for me. So if you open the door, it's open. If you shut it, it's shut. You know? And I did that in downtown Dayton for, I don't know, about 12 or 13 years. Until I got so tired of being down there, they sent me out to the Dayton Mall. And I thought I died and went to heaven. Because in downtown Dayton, I was literally throwing people out the front door. So then he gives me a key to a store out by the Dayton Mall, and again, I thought I died and went to heaven. It was so quiet and peaceful out there. It wasn't like downtown. That one time I had two guys waiting outside for me, and I went downstairs and got a tuba for them. I thought one of them's going to get it. I may get it, but one of them's going to get it. Theodore Epps said, God the Son is the absolute control of all history. Woo! You know what that means? That means your history and my history. He's in control of it. You know what? There's a word that's not in the Bible, but it's used theologically called the providence of God. God's providence is at work. In other words, what he's doing, he moves people around wherever he wants to move them. You know, I've said this before. I came here to sit. We enjoyed James a lot. Jan and I would get in the car and talk about his preaching and we just enjoyed it so much, and what did he do? He ended up and passed away. We were grieved. And then here I am standing behind a pulpit again. Theodore F. said, God the Son is the absolute control of all history. When he opens a door, all the hosts of hell cannot close it. With regard to the church, he said he would build the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. His sovereign power is demonstrated in Pharaoh, to whom he said, Even for this same purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power and my glory, and that my name might be declared throughout the earth. They don't get any better than that, people. If you don't personalize this, you're wasting your time. Please don't waste your time. When you open up the book, it's a letter written especially for you. Right. Read it like it's for you. Not for everybody, but for you. 
Make it personal. You know, a lot of times I pray through that. You know, you can pray through scripture. You can take it and put it in your own words and pray it. I wrote something, and I'm going to say this, but I can't read it. God brought me to Christ to show my family that it was and is Christ that saves and not the church. And listen, I want to tell you something about that, and I've told you before. He used me when I didn't know anything. And I had to start from scratch. And he can use you when you don't know anything. And you can start from scratch. And you start with your family. Start where you're with the people you love. Just tell them, come on over. I've got something I want to share with you. And then open up the word of God to them. I did that and they all got saved. Today they're all walking with Christ, my brothers and elders of the church over there. I'm not special. You are. Number three on your outline sheet, Christ's appearances. Number three, Revelation. And he who sat there like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then I said this, I believe that would put the fear of God in me if I witnessed that. Yeah. How about you? Would that put the fear of God in you? Would you walk more circumspectly before Christ if you seen, had you seen that? I know I would. In reading, in, I'm going to tell you something. As somebody who sold books for 50 years, roughly, one thing about a book, when you open up a book and you start reading it, what you miss in that book is this. You will miss the inflection of what's being said. You miss the voice of that person. You know, when I stand up here, my inflection's going all over the place this morning, you know? But when you read, you don't see that. You don't hear that. But if you read it out loud, you might be able to do that. You might be able to experience that a little better. I'll say this again. I believe that would put the fear of God in me if I witnessed that. In reading, we miss the inflection in God's voice and the angel's voice. You know, there's no place for monotones in the word of God. Read it out loud. Read it out loud. The green jasper and the red sardius or cornelian is reminiscent of the breastplate stones. Stones. Yeah, breastplate stones of the high priest, Exodus 28, 17 to 21. Whereas the rainbow reminds us of the rainbow Noah, no doubt glad to see. I was glad to see one the other night. You know? I thought it was going to rain forever. You know? and it was quite a bit of rain. But you know, I stand in my window, I I've said this before, I've done it so many times, and I've looked out and I've said, you ain't going to flood this country. You ain't going to flood the world no more, God. You promised that after Noah. He said, I'm not going to do that anymore. But he's going to do something else. Believe me. He's not without doing. The Bible commentary said this about verse 2 and 3. And you know, I, when, I, when I put this down, I thought to myself, they're going to think you're lazy, Bob, because you're quoting this big quote. You, should, you can paraphrase that and write it in your own words. Well, maybe I am lazy, but I want to give it to you straight out of the horse's mouth. This Bible commentary said this. In heaven, he saw a great throne with one sitting on it who had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. This jasper is a clear stone in contrast to the opaque jasper stone known today. It may have resembled a diamond. The carnelian 
also known as a ruby. The NIV, in fact, translates it ruby in the Old Testament, and sardis were a ruby-colored red. The jasper and the carnelian were the first and the last of the 12 gemstones worn on the high priest, um, on the high priest. Jasper and sardis used in relation to the king and will be in the foundation of the new Jerusalem. Oh, when we see it coming down, that's what we're going to see. The jasper, the carnelian, uh, the sardis. Uh, the throne's overall appearance was one of great beauty and color, enhanced by a rainbow resembling an emerald which encircled the throne. The green color of the emerald added further beauty to the scene. The 24 elders could refer to the 24 priestly divisions who carry out the worship according to the traditions of the Levites. The elders in this in the vision seem to symbolize the people of God in their worship, just as the Levitical priest represented Israel in the worship of the temple. Listen, I know this for a fact from that description of what that throne, what that throne room is going to look like. Now I understand that when Paul said when he went up, he fell flat on his face. He couldn't even stand. He had to get down on his face on the ground. You know, I, I was in a church where we'd have a prayer meeting. I had, there was one guy in that church. One guy in that church would get in the middle of the aisle, fall flat down, and put his face to the floor, pray. I never heard praying like that. In fact, I didn't want to pray after that because I thought anything I said would be just not anywhere near what this guy had to say. Well, anyway, this vision was so impressive, it also was unsettling. That's what it's going to be to us when we see it. It's going to be impressive and unsettling. And weird with the sight of the four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. You know, I, I couldn't help but think about it. These pictures that we have that people draw of these little men in these flying saucers, how, how they look, you know. Well, they haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to give Earl F. Palmer, one of my favorite buddies, uh, out of the, my commentary, said this These creatures may represent the whole of living creatures as symbolized by the lion, the ox, the man. Spoken by a rabbi, 300 AD. You know, I'll just say this. I said this is the last thing I want to say, but I will say this. When I was in the Catholic Church, and the church that I was a part of had four marble pillars that went all the way up, not quite to the ceiling, four marble pillars. And on top of that was a marble dome that had thing that went around it like this and it had these four living creatures pictures on them and no one ever told me what that meant and I never knew and understood what that meant until I got in the book of Revelation Father God you, you blessed us with your word may your word live richly within us and may it make such a change in our lives that we're never the same Father God, may we have the high privilege this morning of worshiping the most high sovereign God of the universe who rules and reigns forever and ever. And may we, in our humanness even, bring glory and honor to you. For that's why we worship today, to glory and honor our God. For it's the name of his Son that we pray and that we live and move and have our existence. Jesus Christ, amen. amen.